Good afternoon. Um, so this is our second uh, lecture on syntax today. Um, so we talked about some of the basic principles of syntax, uh, syntactic change last time, so reanalysis and extension, um, and we looked at a few examples of how that might work. Um, the second handout, handout number 16, so you can follow along um, if you want to print that out, uh, or just look at it on your laptop by next to this video. Um, so this handout has four case studies, basically, of syntactic change, where we can see um, sometimes in the corpus some of the changes that occurred over time, and we can make sense of why they happened. Um, now, you know, like I've said a few times, uh, with syntactic change, um, there's not as much directionality. We can't always exactly tell how things are going to happen, but there are certainly trends, and there are a lot of things that make a lot of sense and we can analyze. Um, so that's kind of lending itself to uh, a kind of case study analysis of the, some of these changes. Um, so the first one is familiar. We're not going to spend too much time with this one because we already talked about it. So the development of the periphrastic future tense in Greek. Um, this is... Uh, so I, I mentioned also before that um, you know, grammaticalization is kind of in between morphology and syntax and semantics, so um, we've already talked about this example in, with respect to grammaticalization. Um, but anyway, we can take another look at it and uh, at some of the details of how this change occurred. So, um, in modern Greek, you get these constructions, something like this. Um, so this is the word uh, I write or I am writing. And then, then you, which is grafo, something like that, and then you have a future marker, tha. And um, this developed from uh, an older construction where uh, the future marker tha actually used to be the verb to want. This is very similar from will developing in English from to will to do something. Um, but you can see all these stages of syntactic change occurring uh, very similarly in Greek. Um, so the stages here, um, so originally you wouldn't have said uh, you would have said uh, can't decide which orthography, IPA, Greek alphabet, or romanization here, but um, anyway, so you would have said uh, I want to write, something like that. Um, that was the original construction that gave birth to something like tha-rafo, meaning I will write. Different meaning, uh, phonetically, phonologically changed as well. Um, but, so how did this happen exactly? Um, so again, some of this will be familiar, some of it may not be. Um, so first of all, uh, and this is the part I don't think we talked about exactly, but some of this was actually triggered, like this sometimes happens, by a sound change. Um, you had final ends being lost in some words. I'm not sure if it's all words or some words, um, but in particular in these infinitive forms, uh, the final n was being lost. And so this gave rise to some ambiguity here because grafe, grape, however you would say this, in, I don't know if we're in, in ancient Greek or mid, uh, modern Greek at this point, somewhere in between, uh, this is the third person singular form that ends in a, whereas the infinitive infinitive used to end in ain. Now both the third person singular, uh, he writes, and to write end in the same ending, so they look exactly the same. Um, so when that happened, um, this almost looks like you have two inflected forms. Uh, I want and he writes, or it could be I want, uh, well, well, yeah. So if you were trying to say I want to write, it almost, it would sound exactly the same as saying I want, I write. So it looks like um, a little bit of a change here in the construction where you would just have to say, um, I want to write, and then now it's like you're allowed to have two inflected verbs. And just kind of like in English, we have uh, a that um, that you put in there, the word that, when you have two inflected verbs like this. So I, uh, I want, um, you might say for him to write, or I want that he writes, 
or something like that. So when you started to get these two inflected forms, people started to put a that in there, which they didn't have to do before if you were just saying, I want to write, just like in English. You don't have to say, I want that I write, or I want that to write, or something like that. So they started putting in hina, which is that. So fellow hina grafe. Um, anyway, so these are some of the syntactic changes. And then, so I've got syntactic changes, uh, semantic shift, and phonological changes. Um, and uh, right, so then you get this new word in here. Um, and you have the sem semantic part. Um, basically, this kind of widening or abstraction of uh, what I want means. We've talked about this several times now, that wanting to do something or even going somewhere, some of these different ideas have this pragmatic sense of that's something that's going to happen in the future. Um, so uh, that, at some point, that meaning becomes the more dominant interpretation. So you have the reanalysis and then you have extension of the semantic meaning. And people start to use this to mean um, I, uh, or, or um, that's, that's he will write instead of like, I want that he will write, or he wants that he, uh, he wants that he writes, you know, becomes he will write. Um, because if he wants that he will, <laughs> that he writes, then um, it implies that that's something that's going to happen in the future. So we've seen that before. Um, and additionally, you have um, some morphological, uh, so that's just what I have there, is volitional to future tense meaning. And then you have some phonological reduction. We talked about the fact that the semantic reduction um, and phonological reduction go hand in hand. Um, so fellow hina sort of started to be treated as a single uh, uh, phrase here, fellow hina, um, and it dropped. Um, I didn't on this handout put all the intermediate stages, but basically um, all this middle part dropped um, syllable by syllable, and you're just left with the uh, grafe. And interestingly enough, you see how um, you transferred from, see so when you said fellow graphene, the graphene part was uninflected and I want was marked for, you know, first person singular in that case. I want to write. But by the end, once you're to this stage, um, the final stage here, where tha is the future tense, tha is, not, is no longer, longer marked for person, uh, but you mark the, the, what is now the main verb here that used to be the infinitive, now that's marked with the person, in this case first person singular. Um, so we're, right, that ending was here before and now it's here, It's basically what I'm saying. Um, if you want to say I, uh, he will write, so I will write, uh, tha grafo, he will write would be tha grafe, something like that. Uh, I'm not actually sure if there are any changes uh, in the vowel or anything like that in modern Greek, but uh, theoretically that would be how that would be said. Um, and as I said, a very similar process to ha that happened in English with will. Um, this is just cross-linguistic uh, commonality that you get. Um, so that's the first uh, case study. The second one, we're looking at how we developed um, in, uh, in English, uh, starting with Old English anyway, the perfect construction from the verb to have. You know, I have read a book, I have learned something, um, that no longer means have as in possession, and of course we still have that, have that word, I have a book, um, something like that, uh, but you can say I have read a book, and the have there of course is, is an aspectual marker, that, that's something that's completed, you know, the, uh, the present perfect. Um, and uh, so, right, how did this begin? Um, so you had constructions like this. So he has the fish caught. And this sounds a little bit strange in modern English, but we do have some analogous phrases. Um, like if you said, he has, he has the assignment finished, or something like that. He has it done, he has the assignment done, something like that. You get this past participle form here. Um, and it's describing the word that it follows, the word that it, uh, yeah, the word before it. Um, and uh, so it's like he's holding, he has a fish caught. <laughs> Maybe think of it, um, he has a caught fish, or he has, um, 
uh, it was the caught fish that he has. You know, rearrange it there just so we're, we're not ambiguous on what this would mean, even though it's an awkward construction, particularly in modern English. So this was basically adjectival. It was just describing the status, uh, the state of that fish being caught. So um, we see examples of this in Old English, um, and uh, you'll see that um, just like in Spanish or uh, German, uh, you have agreement between the adjectives that modify the nouns, and that's what you see with these participial forms. Um, so number one, I'm just jumping down to number one at the bottom of the page there. Um, when he had, uh, when he, that book had learned, um, this form, however that's pronounced. Um, this actually has an inflectional ending on the end of it. And this is modifying uh, the word book. It's a book uh, that's learned. He has the learned book. It's basically kind of what's that, what is being said there. Um, so this is agreeing in the, uh, with the thing that is modifying. It's taking an ending that probably matches in uh, being singular and masculine neuter, whatever, it's probably neuter, um, uh, to uh, agree with balk, the word meaning book there. Um, anyway, so that's how this used to be. And so, again, has still just meant, uh, as was a content verb, without any kind of aspectual meaning, it was just having or holding something. Um, but the next thing that happened um, was the ending started to drop off. So it was not always agreeing with the thing it was modifying. I mean, you can see that in the second example here. Um, you end up getting uh, near the end of the phrase here. Um, so you have book or books, it seems like here, but you have an uninflected form in number two. There's no ending that would match in probably neuter plural uh, because of modifying books, the learned books. But in that sense, people weren't thinking of it at this point as modifying books, as rather just being a verb form, perhaps. Um, and so, right, you started to lose this ending. Um, and, uh, and this verb would still usually be um, uh, towards the end of the sentence and not next to uh, the object. So the book, uh, let's see, when he had that book, um, when he, that book, had learned. So this learned form, you know, is at the end of the sentence. Um, but the book being the object there, um, you had these forms move back. So this is transposition, as I say, in number B in the middle of the page there, transposition of the object and the particle. Um, so this would be like going to saying something like, when he uh, had learned that book. And now it's not inflected, but the learned has moved from the end of the sentence up in front of the object, right? Um, so now we're getting something that looks a lot more like the construction um, in English today. Um, and so then, basically, you have a reanalysis of what, uh, what the main verb is. Um, so have learned. Um, originally, it was to have something that was learned, so have was more the main verb. Um, that was the one... Uh, uh, um, right, so, uh, but later on, the have is just a, uh, a, a, an expect, a spectral marker, and the main verb ends up being learned. Um, so he has learned uh, that book, when he had learned that book would be closer to how we would say that in modern English. Um, and so along with that, um, and then the last thing here, so unified construction. So the verb, the auxiliary, the have, and then the verb are now really thought of as going together. You know, you can't really, you can't move one of those to the end of the sentence or something like that. They're really two parts of one thing at this point. Um, so that kind of explains, at least syntactically, how um, this change occurred. Uh, and a few more notes of the semantic change it went from have like holding or having something to meaning possession and then to meaning uh, resulting state, so the result of some kind of action, um, and then eventually to uh, meaning something like an action was completed, 
and that's the perfect aspect um, the way we use it today. So you can see also the semantic shift that occurred while this word was changing in its syntactic patterning. Um, and, and of course we even get some phonological change because today you don't have to say have, you can just say I've read the book. So it's also undergoing, uh, has undergone phonological reduction. Um, so that's the second example here. Um, uh, the second case study, the, the development of the uh, paraphrastic perfect aspect in English. Um, and so the third one here, auxiliary movement and word order change in German. So this is specifically looking at how uh, German went from being uh, SOV to SVO. So if you recall, um, Proto Indo European, you see this in Latin. Um, a, a lot of the older Indo European languages had an SOV word order, so the object went before the verb. Um, but a lot of the daughter languages, actually, interestingly enough, in the Romance family and in the Germanic family, now have a primarily SVO word order. So, how did that change exactly? Um, so, there are quite a few uh, things listed here to show this change. Um, so, uh, Originally, one of the ideas was that perhaps, you know, we talked a little bit, little bit about um, what the important elements in words are, um, and uh, so people thought um, maybe the object being less important started to just be placed at the end. And that seems sort of like an ad hoc explanation. Um, right, I mean, Latin went a long time without having any problem having that before the object, before the verb. Um, but uh, looking more closely at some examples that we get from early runic uh, examples of uh, Germanic, we can see some of the changes that actually took place. Um, so you can see uh, some of these auxiliary verbs, um, uh, just like regular verbs, they were placed at the end, so it was an SOV language. But the change actually started with the auxiliaries. So an auxiliary here we have um, like is menaced by evil spirit, so is menaced, is is the auxiliary, menaced is the main verb, was destined uh, for the throes, was is the auxiliary, destined is the main verb. And um, so the point was the auxiliaries pattern just like the main verbs at its very early state, I don't know, this is probably like 300 AD or something like that, um, and so you would say something like Flagda, Vikinas, ist. So you put, I don't know, sounds like Latin or something, um, you put the is form at the end of uh, it being an auxiliary, you put it at the end of the sentence, just like any other type of verb, or therawian haitinas was. So was there also being at the end of the sentence, just like you would expect in an SOV language, as Indo -European, many Indo-European languages were. Um, Later, uh, as uh, we've seen in other cases, um, auxiliary started to become clitics. So they became a little bit more grammaticalized um, and they underwent some phonological reduction. So in English, you know, um, is can be reduced to just s. And that has actually been going on for some time. You can see this even in uh, Old English in the examples below that I'll show in just a minute. Um, but so ist was sometimes pronounced as just S or something like that, or probably the T being dropped off or, or um, the vowel being reduced, or probably a number of different possibilities, but sometimes even just an S. You know, uh, 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 is, he is menaced by evil spirits, you could say he's menaced, like that, with the, with the auxiliary um, reduced in such a way. Now, there's uh, an interesting law, uh, Vakernagel's law, um, which is that for some reason, uh, I'm not sure why this happens, but uh, it's been observed in many different languages, that clitics uh, tend to want to move towards second position in sentences. Um, you see this weird second uh, position phenomenon in a lot of different languages, like in Greek you put the subject and then you put these little discourse particles. Um, and uh, right, so, by second position, it doesn't always mean the second word, but it, it would be basically right after the first um, constituent. It might be the subject, uh, subject noun phrase or something like that. 
Um, and actually the example here is the word not. But anyway, um, so you see, uh, so when this, uh, the auxiliary started to become more like clitics, they could uh, at least optionally occur in second position, so they started to move way up to the front. And that would be in a lot of cases where the verb is today in English. So, um, I won't write the whole thing out, you can look at the example on the paper, but ni and then s, that's ist, just as the clitic, uh, solu, etc., etc., and then beowulf, where the, the auxiliary, um, that's was, so to beowulf was in battle, uh, given. Um, glory is in there somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, and so you see that once, uh, again, once these auxiliaries started to become clitics, they started to show up optionally in second position. So that's following back Renagel's law. Um, now, uh, then, uh, once these auxiliaries started to show up quite frequently in second position, maybe even when they weren't reduced, um, you started to see extension of this pattern. Um, so uh, not only the auxiliaries occurring there, but sometimes even main verbs. So main verbs started to pattern like the auxiliary verbs. So you see here these examples like way witan, blah blah blah, we know another island uh, east from here. So this is another example that was found. Um, this is uh, probably 900, 1000 AD, something like this, still Old English, but you start to see examples with the verb in second position right after the subject. So we're pretty much to the point um, uh, at this point uh, of having SVO word order. So you can see some of the sequences of changes that it underwent. Now I want to talk a little bit about German with respect to this example um, as well. So German actually today, um, so it does the same thing so far that we've talked about. Um, you put the subject and then the verb. Um, but the weird thing is in German, uh, they've, I don't know if it's weird, but they've, that's as far as they went. And in fact, you could only put, there's a space for only one verb in second position. That is to say, if you have a compound verb or some kind of paraphrastic uh, uh, construction where you have uh, an auxiliary and a main verb, only one of those um, can be put in second position. And uh, so that's usually going to be the auxiliary, and then the main verb actually stays where it, always, where it used to be uh, and still is in German. Um, so you still see this traces of verb final position. So this is, um, as is on the handout, you would just say, er liebt seine Frau, um, liebt is love, so he loves his wife. Normal English SOV word order, um, or normal, uh, very much like English would, um, he loves his wife. Um, but if you say he has loved his wife, so in English, has and loved are just right next to each other. All parts of the verb are put in uh, second position or basically right after the subject. But in German, they st still have not uh, developed to that point, so you still see the verb at the end of the sentence, one of the verbs being the main verb. So, er hat seine Frau geliebt. Um, so he has, literally word by word, he has his wife uh, loved. Loved is still at the end of the sentence. So we saw that with some of the old English sentences. Um, with the verb in the final position, and you still see traces of that when you get two verb forms, an auxiliary and a main verb, that the, the uh, main verb is still hanging out at the end of the sentence. Now, there's another law that accounts for why this change, ha change happened in English. This is Behagel's law, um, that basically when you have two parts, uh, you know, this like, like composite verb with an auxiliary and a main verb, that there's a tendency for them to want to occur next to each other and not be discon discontinuous um, in different parts of the sentence. So, um, English, uh, English also followed this pattern um, where an auxiliary would be at the end. I don't think I have an example here, but you see uh, in later English that even when you have an auxiliary and a main verb, they would both occur next to each other. So the Lord was speaking these words to Moses. Dritten, uh, dritten, was sprechende. So this form here. is the auxiliary and the main verb, and they're both occurring next to each other um, after the subject and before the object. 
Um, and another interesting thing is uh, you see a lag um, in this word order change. Um, this happened first in main verbal clauses, um, whereas in uh, uh, relative clauses, um, the, the order word order persisted. In fact, in German today, you still see it's basically SOV word order in uh, relative clauses. Um, and you can see this uh, still occurring in Old English. So you see the first phrase here, this, uh, this sind the Friedmal and the forward. <laughs> see, um, so sind is the verb there this send, so that's SOV, and that's in the main clause. Um, but in the relative clause, uh, it's at the end of the bracket there, um, they ethored king and el his witan with dona her ged don habad. Um, so at the very end, so uh, this is a relative clause, so there, um, these are the articles of peace and stipulations which, so that's the beginning of the relative clause, which King Ethelred and his counselors have undertaken with his army. So within that relative clause, you still maintain uh, verb final uh, construction, SOV word order, basically within um, these relative clauses. Um, and you can see that, Gedon uh, Habad. In fact, this looks like a have, um, yeah, have undertaken. It's a, it's a two-part verb, but both of them are still hanging out at the end of the sentence. None of them have moved up to second position. Um, but anyway, we know that's changed in English. You would just say, which King Ethelred and his counselors have undertaken with his army. You wouldn't stick the verb at the end, even in a relative clause. Um, but in German, you still see, um, you know, even though it's SVO in main clauses, you still get SOV in the embedded and relative clauses. So, alle wissen, dass er seine Frau liebt. Um, so, all know that, so this embedded clause here, that he loves his wife, dass er seine Frau, that he, his wife, liebt. Liebt being at the end there, the word for love. So, you still see these traces of SOV word order in German, whereas um, English uh, has eradicated all of this SOV everywhere. You always get the auxiliaries and main verbs next to each other. So I think that's interesting to see how those changes have taken place um, over time. So um, the fourth case study we're going to look at is the development of ergativity. So what is ergativity exactly? Um, I'm guessing uh, you probably come across this if you've taken a uh, grammatical analysis class or something. Um, so, but I'll review this anyway. So there are three different things we're going to talk about here, and we're going to call these A, O, and S. A, that kind of stands for agent, um, and these are subjects of transitive sentences. An O is an object that would be in a transitive sentence. And finally, S would be a subject of an intransitive verb with only one argument with no object. Um, so just some examples here. Um, A and O, okay, those are pretty straightforward. So um, basically your subjects and objects in transitive sentences. So Bob is an agent in Bob saw the zebra, or the zebra ate the shrub. So uh, see and eat, those are both um, transitive verbs. And the objects of both of those are agents. They're volitionally uh, bringing about some kind of action. Um, and uh, then the objects in both of those sentences would just be O, so Bob saw the zebra, the zebra ate the shrub. In those two sentences, um, the object is an O. So where do we get these S's exactly? This would be in sentences like Bob left, Mary cried, the zebra died. So in all of those sentences, we have verbs uh, leave, cry, and die, which are intransitive. They don't have any kind of object. So the subjects of those, we'll call those S's, um, subjects of intransitive sentences. And so alignment has to do with, um, of, of these three, um, how do they align? How do they pattern together in the way that they're marked morphologically? Um, and there are a number of ways that languages do this. We're going to look at the two main types. Um, so in English, oops, that's not right. 
let's just write this again um, so it's easier to draw circles around these. So A, S, and O. So English, English and actually most languages are nom have nominative accusative alignment. And that's where these two, the subjects of transitives and the subjects of intransitives, are both treated the same as just subjects. It doesn't matter the transitivity of the verb. And then the object um, is marked differently in some way. It's actually a little bit hard to tell in English like what things are marked in what ways because um, we don't have a lot of uh, inflectional endings and that kind of thing. Uh, but we can see this in the pronouns. So you would say, so an S here, he left, the subject of an intransitive verb. We use the form he. Um, and then he hit him. So he being the agent of that verb, um, that's also that would be an agent in that case. And we use the form he just like we would an S and he left, he and he. But for an O, so he hit him, uh, the object of a transitive verb there, the, uh, we use a different form, the object form uh, being him instead of he. So what would this look like instead if English was uh, ergative absolute, abs if English had ergative absolutive alignment? So this is a different type of alignment where instead of A and S patterning together, S and O pattern together, and A is marked differently in some way. So, um, again, let's think, I think the easiest way to think about this is if we say what would English look like if it were ergative absolutive. Um, and this would be like if you said, he hit him. So we would use a he, or, you know, one form for an, the A, the agent, uh, the subject of a um, transitive uh, a sentence and a different form for the O, um, so the uh, object of a transitive sentence. But if you say something like he would want to say something like he left, you would actually say him left. So the same form would be used for the subject of an intransitive verb as would be used for the object of a transitive verb. So this is the alignment you would get. Um, so it's the same patterning of the S's and O's. If that's still maybe a little bit confusing, or like, why would any language do that? There's actually some traces of ergativity in English. Um, so we have the, uh, the or and E endings for people who do something or have something done to them. So uh, if you, we want to look at the A versus the O here, we have words like mentor and mentee. So this is a transitive verb to uh, mentor somebody. So a mentor, a mentor, is somebody who mentors someone else, and a mentee is somebody who is mentored by another person, right? So men to mentor somebody, that's a uh, transitive idea. You have the one person doing it, the one other one having that done to them. Now the interesting thing is, um, for verbs that are um, intransitive, where their subject would be an S, um, the ending we use is actually uh, the same one we use for the O. So if you have, um, so to escape, that's intransitive, there's no object, you can't escape something. Um, so he escaped, um, he would be an O there. But if you say somebody who escaped, you don't call them an escaper, you might call them an escapee. So um, the, the or versus E usage here E is actually um, absolute if you mark it both on objects of transitives and on uh, subjects of intransitives. But other languages, this is much, this is just like hardwired into everything in the language throughout. Um, so good example here is Basque, which is considered uh, an ergative absolute of language. So you'll see um, if you focus on some of these words like man and girl here, so gizona, that's man, uh, hell do zen, the man arrived, and this is a form meaning to do zen, so it's basically the man did arrive, um, that's just needed to make that grammatical in Basque. But then if you say, so this is intransitive, the man arrived, so you get this form. Now when it's transitive and the man is doing something to somebody else, such as seeing, um, 
a, the girl here, you add a K. So this is the agentive marker. Gizonak neska ikusi zuen. So these are both like subjects, but one is the subject of a transitive, the other is the subject of an intransitive, and you see that they're marked differently. Whereas, you know, this this is a um, absolutive here. Um, the girl that's an object of a transitive sentence, it's also, it doesn't have any suffix, just like the object of an intransitive verb. And then in the next example, like the girl saw the man, as you would predict, neska, then it's neskak, uh, with the k, ergative ending, and we're back to gizona, uh, ikusi, zuen. So gizona here, um, just like man, uh, no suffix, when it's the object of a transitive verb, same as when it's the, uh, the subject of an intransitive. Um, so this is kind of interesting. Um, one thing you'll point, uh, I should point out, and then we'll talk about how this developed, because that's what we're really interested in here. Um, in ergative absolutive languages, uh, the absolutive is actually usually the one that's more marked. It's the one that gets a suffix. If, if only one of the two, the ergatives or the absolutives, get a suffix, then it's usually the ergatives, the subjects of the transitive sentences. Um, and so you see the K is marked, but nothing is marked on the other form. So that's kind of important to keep in mind, uh, because it suggests maybe something about how this developed in the first place. Um, so what happened? Um, so we have reanalysis and extension, just like uh, the same principles that guide syntactic change um, as in other cases that we've seen. So. If you think about how, uh, I mentioned how the agent is the one, or the ergative thing there is, is the one that's marked. Um, and we actually get something like that in a passive construction. So if you say something like, um, the girl was seen by the man. So the agent here is by the man, and that's the one that has extra stuff added to it, whether it's suffixes, prefixes, or just words like by, the, um, but girl, it's actually the object here, and it's not really marked with anything in particular. So you see something kind of similar to that, but what we were talking about, about before with this ergative structures, with these um, ergative um, uh, constructions, um, those weren't passive, those were considered to be active, so it wasn't like this sentence. Um, because it wasn't, uh, yeah, you wouldn't translate that as the girl was seen by the man or something like that when you had Gizonak, the uh, ergative form. But anyway, but the point is, um, in a passive construction, you get uh, the agent is the one that's more marked in some way. You don't even have to have that in a sentence. You can just say the girl was seen. Um, but that can be the source of these particular uh, ergative absolutive type constructions. So what tends to happen is, um, the language marks in a passive sentence the agent with some kind of suffix that might be something like an instrumental case, uh, maybe something like the girl was seen, you know, with the man, by the man. Um, so instrumental using something, um, it doesn't have to be instrumental, but some case marker was used uh, to mark this agent. But, um, so in theory, you might have had something like this, which of course sounds exactly like, on the surface, what you get today, but it was reanalyzed. So remember, Gizona Kneska Kusizuen, so the man, the girl sees, um, and you have the, uh, the K marker here for the ergative. Now, the theory is um, that at a previous time, this was probably a passive sentence. So this was like a passive verb um, to see. And this was basically like saying the girl was seen and then by the man. So the K was marking it with some kind of um, <coughs> uh, case like instrumental. But on the surface, you have this and then right below that, reanalyzed as, well, you have the same surface sentence, but it could have a different interpretation, which is basically an active interpretation. So man, but marked with, with a suffix, uh, and then girl, uh, and then active uh, verb here uh, to see. So uh, the man, marked with now an ergative marker, um, saw the girl. 
And of course it's the same thing on the surface, but people reanalyze maybe how this is being interpreted. Um, but of course we know with reanalysis you get some extension somewhere where you wouldn't have seen that particular construction, um, or, or there's some change elsewhere in the language now that something has been reanalyzed, and then you know that it's been reanalyzed as such. So for example, um, let's say you know this used to be the instrumental, an instrumental K, but now it's treated as being ergative. What you might see, the evidence you might see of that, and thus the extension part, is that you may no longer, it may be that you no longer use um, that marker for inanimate objects. Um, like if you had the word stick, um, you could, that'd be a great instrumental there. You know, John hit the wall with a stick. With a stick, using a stick, that would be the instrumental case. Um, and so, uh, I, again, I don't think this is like a tested, we don't have records far enough of BAS to show this, but um, from looking at other examples, it is theorized that, um, that this might have been something like an instrumental case ending. Um, and the point is, once that's reanalyzed being ergative, and you have sentences like this, where this is not treated as being passive, but active with an ergative marker, then you would no longer want to use this ergative marker, you know, the agent of a transitive verb, like sticks can't decide to do things, they aren't completing actions like that. Um, then you would know when that's no longer being used um, instrumentally, that that has actually now been uh, ex extended to other usage where, usages where it's very clear that reanalysis has occurred. And we've gone from an instrumental suffix to an ergative suffix, and the whole alignment of the language has changed. So um, that's all for today. Um, we'll continue uh, probably talking about borrowing next time. Um, and of course, remember the exam will be uh, on Monday, and this is as far as it's going to cover. So have a good day, and I'll see you next time.